This is a new series that I'm going to do on, I call it a culture of slanders and slurs, because I think this is a real problem in our society. We're dealing with positions and advocates that we disagree with by assassinating their character, and we say things that we know are not true or that we haven't bothered to research, but we don't care if they're true or not. We just want to take out the opposition. This is not <laughs> the way that a civilized society goes about uh, communicating with its, that you communicate with your neighbors. I think the problem, the root problem here, could be described, as I've said in previous videos, as being uh, our problem with how we conceive of time. In our contemporary society, we think of reality as being laid out on this chronological uh, timeline that moves linearly from one point to another. Of course, that's the natural way for humans to think, but we overemphasize that so much that our whole value system is projected into tomorrow. We don't consider that what we do today in and of itself uh, is susceptible to being evaluated by some moral standard. The moral standard is going to be tomorrow. You just wait and see how great tomorrow is. And you're going to like it so much that you'll forget about all the mudslinging and backstabbing that we did today. The end justifies the means. It's Machiavellian in a more classical sense, but I think it, it doesn't really have an analog in earlier history. It's gotten so bad that we actually have developed an industry of looking back at our ancestors and uh, defaming them. I use that word in the title of this video. We're defaming the people that we came from. It seems to me that there's a kind of moral laziness here that makes our, our turpitude all the worse. It's it, you know bad enough to tell lies, but when you're a lazy liar, that's what you, when you start doing what we're doing today. Instead of trying to lift ourselves up and actually do something in the world to make it better, uh, even if our standard for doing that involves killing or slandering or sending a lot of people off to the concentration camps, but still at least we were exerting some kind of energy to climb the hill. But no, what we do today is just excavate around the plane that we're standing on so that at the end of the day it looks like we're on a hill. We tear everybody down who's around us. Um, <clears throat> I just happened to have read the other day an article about this 1619 project that's being done through the New York Times and some other outfit and the objective is to create textbooks for Young kids, you know, we're talking, I think, all the way down into grade school. Kids who don't know any American history except what they might pick up on the TV, God forbid. And uh, the 1619 textbook is telling our kids, among other things, that the American Revolution was fought to preserve slavery. Um, the British had outlawed slavery, and uh, the... American colonists said, no, 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 take our slaves away. We're, you try to do that, we're going to rebel. So uh, that's the reason we had a revolution, kids. See, the foundation of our whole country really stinks. We're not very good people, or at least, you know, we are, because we realize that what our ancestors did was just downright wicked. So we tear them down, we slander them, we say a bunch of crap about them, which is demonstrably false from so many different directions, and then that makes us look so good in comparison that we, we really don't have to lift a finger to do anything useful today. Um, I, gosh, where would you even start? Slavery was not legal throughout all of the colonies, although, uh, Mr. Lincoln, in passing his Emancipation Proclamation, did grandfather slavery into the border states that were siding with the Union. So there was a kind of hypocrisy there that isn't much talked about. Also, a lot of the southern states 
uh, I just found this out quite recently. History is hard, you know, it's complex and you really have to dig. But the southern states had more uh, abolition societies, abolitionist societies, than you found in the much more populated north until the homicidal uprising staged by John Brown. And at that point, Southerners became so terrified of setting the slaves free that the abolition societies kind of withered away. But the Civil War itself was very complex. But if you even take the simplistic view that, no, 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 it was just about slavery. All the Southerners were, even though something like 95% of Southerners didn't have slaves, but if you just take that view that they all wanted to keep their slaves, then, uh, well, we, about three quarters of a million of us who were uh, alive in the nation at that time died fighting to free the slaves or to keep the slave. But, you know, we killed our brothers over this issue, and eventually the slaves were set free. Uh, as far as Britain's role in being the moral superior that wanted the slaves liberated, yeah, there were no slaves in the British Isles. There were a lot of British colonies where people were not treated too well, perhaps, or where British officers just sort of looked the other way while the local slave trade went about its business in northwestern Africa. But uh, I think of the Irish potato famines, for instance, where the Irish peasants were not useful anymore as rent payers in these little farms that were called rundles, these systems where they just paid their landlords every year. That was not very profitable. The landlords wanted to be more progressive and put all the land under uh, grazing, I believe, but uh, in any case, a large part of the motivation for potato famine was to let the peasants starve, even though there was food to feed them, but they were paying that food to their landlords. That was a cash crop, and the potatoes were what they had left over to eat. And when the famine came and the potatoes failed, uh, that was the fulcrum that the landlord system used to get the peasants to leave and go to the go to Quebec or to New York and just get them out of here because we want to do other things with their land. So that wasn't too nice either. I'm not trying to... See, it's so easy to play this game. I could, I could turn this around and stereotype all the British and say what nasty characters they were. If you, if you do this hit-and-run kind of history, which something like the 1619 Project is now doing to our little kids who don't know any better, uh, and this kind of garbage is being taught all the way through college and even grad school, if, if you do this kind of ideologically motivated, uh, very selective cherry-picking of history, you can defame any group of people that you like. Western Europeans, white people, males, anyone you like. It's like a poll. You tell me uh, what result you want, and I'll write the question, and I'll get you that result. What was uh, Stalin's propaganda minister, justice minister's <laughs> justice name, Beria, I think. Beria said to Stalin, uh, you show me the man and I'll find you a crime. That could be the, uh, the motto over our history departments at university. Look, we're here, right here, right now, as I've been saying in other talks of this sort. And by the way, I've got a little book out on Amazon. I call it The Eternal Moment, Seeking Divine Presence in the Present. And I actually put together a lot of ideas that came to me in these talks in this little book. I'm not trying to sell the book. You, you can I'd be happy if you buy it, but you know what? If you contact me through semperluxmundi.org and say you'd don't have the money to buy it, but you'd like to read it, I'll send you a PDF for nothing. Um, I'd just like you to be exposed to these ideas and think about them. We, uh, our worth as human beings is not something that we have to reach farther down the timeline, farther up the road. Our duty as human beings is not something that can be sanitized because we will reach that golden destination sometime 
and that's going to reflect back on all that we've done today and just, just erase it. It's going to be okay because we're headed, our intentions are good and we're headed for a good place. Or even if we don't get to the good place, the fact that we had good intentions is going to mop up all the blood and tears. Uh, no, we're all right here, right now. Our responsibility is to handle situations uh, in as good a fashion as we possibly can right immediately right now. And not only that, but our fathers and forefathers and our grandmothers and all the people that are behind us are our brothers and sisters. I talk about this in the book. It seems kind of cockeyed, and it is on the surface, but I think from God's perspective, and you can find several passages in the Bible that essentially say this, that we don't have many fathers, we have one father, we have God in heaven. All the rest of us are his children. Our fathers, in a sense, and our mothers are our brothers and sisters. How does that work? Well, if you compress time, if you forget about the timeline or kind of turn it around and make everything contemporaneous, we're all existing as human beings in the same kind of existential struggle. Things change, technology changes, of course, but, but basically we're, we live a while and then we die and we struggle with disease and we struggle with growing up and uh, social situations. We're, we're all human beings. We all have flaws. We all make mistakes. Most of us, I hope, I think, have virtues. We have special qualities. Uh, people screw up. But how corrupt, how morally contemptible is it to do nothing with your life, but instead to train your attention back on those who came before you and who tried and naturally messed up in some respects, and then you highlight all the ways that they messed up so that you don't have to do anything now except just sit here. You already look better because you're not making their mistakes, at least. Uh, that's... That disgusts me, frankly. I know that young people don't know any better who are being fed this kind of propaganda, and, and but, but that makes it all the worse for the people who are designing these programs in academia and elsewhere to try to fill young people's minds with this, this uh, morally bankrupt, contemptible sort of approach to life, just at the point when they're about to cross the threshold and make their own way in life. It's such a horrible way of thinking about the world. Um, I think I'll wrap this up just by presenting the story that many of you already know and has probably occurred to you as you uh, have heard me talk. It's the story from, it only appears in one place in the Gospels. It's in Luke chapter 18. You know what? I'm going to just recurred to this little book here that I found I don't know where, but it's it's uh, a Welsh catechism that was originally printed in 1612. It was reprinted in, 13, in, in 1931, but it's still, this is now almost a century old, even in reprint. And it's got these funny, you know, every eighth page, the way that the printers used to do this was they would take a big piece of paper and fold it up several times, and so I think it's about every eighth page needs to be cut by a letter opener or what they would have called a pen knife. And I haven't cut these pages because I just don't have the heart. This is such a classic as it is. But one of the pages that I can open and read actually shows, I mean, it's a catechism. It's not a New Testament, but it shows you how even in 1612, back when those uh, evil, wicked, white European males were living, but some of them must have thought that Luke 18 was important enough to put into the catechism, is they actually reproduced the passage. And it's about the, uh, scri the, the Pharisee and the publican, the tax collector, who both go to the temple at the same time. And the Pharisee uh, is so happy that he is who he is. And he praises God for all of Lord, thank you so much for making me me. I'm such a virtuous person. I 
Uh, I'm not a, he talks about what he's not. I'm not treacherous. I'm not an adulterer. Uh, and then he talks about some kind of formalistic things he does. Um, I'm not like that publican over there, and we know how tax collectors are such cheats. It we've in them pretty odd we white, you know, with nos, it we've in degumi command or akavedav. I can't read Welsh too well, but he says, I uh, tithe when I can and I, I uh, fast every couple of weeks. I'm you know, he's, he's talking about really superficial things, and he's just giving himself a big hug before God. And, Thank you for making me me. <laughs> what a gift to the world I am. I'm so lucky that I'm myself. And, of course, the poor publican, the tax collector, is so devastated by his consciousness of sin that he doesn't even lift up his eyes when he prays. He just beats himself, and he says... Uh, Lord, I'm such a sinner. Please forgive me. And uh, Jesus says, one of these two men goes home justified. And it's not the Pharisee. We don't want to be the Pharisee. You don't want to be that way. Don't puff yourself up by sneering at other people around you. Uh, slandering and slurring and telling lies uh, because it is a lie, isn't it? Don't you see that to present yourself as just automatically better than those around? Don't you know that you make mistakes too? You really think you're that all that much better than people who uh, say own slaves at one time because that was the culture, that was the history. It's been our history for you know Native Americans enslaved each other. To it's part of the miserable human condition that we're trying to prevail against. But we all are engaged in that struggle, and we all screw up. And if, if, our, if we're still here, if we have great-grandchildren looking back at us, oh my gosh, what kind of things are they going to see that we did, that we were too corrupt and filthy and vile to recognize? You want to really submit yourself to that kind of standard? No, you don't. You, you want to be a superior, a truly superior moral person, and that really means that you have to win the fight against yourself. Stop listening to people who point you at like a, a weapon at the past or at other people around you. Just stand in front of the mirror and look at yourself, and you'll quickly stop slurring other people.